So we're coming up to the EU referendum. EU referendum. Okay, straw poll. Anyone brave enough to say you want to stay in? It's the rat poison. I know all the... I mean, there's some great reasons for staying in. You know, from the environmental standpoint, from the... Um, European uh, Convention on Human Rights standpoint, you know, shit, I use these things in my recent um, appearances in court. You know, I'm not going to not use them while I have the opportunity, but it's the sugar coating on the cyanide. Now, it is going to be manipulated, that's for sure. You know, there's not one shadow of doubt about that. But the key element of this, anybody who says that you know, we, we should stay in, and like I said, you know, I understand if you just look at the surface elements, there's a lot of potentially, apparently, good reasons for staying in. But who sets the EU legislation? Who sets the EU legislation? Huh? Uh, see, we're not sure, are we? How long have we been in the EU? Since, yeah, too long. Since Edward Heath lied... To the people of the country in 73 and 4 about the potential of joining the European Economic Community. I was 18. It was my first opportunity to vote. And I thought, this is great. This is a great opportunity to be part of something big. It's your fault. It's my fault. <laughs> Because we got in by just one vote, and it was my vote. <laughs> I fell for it hook, line, and sinker. With my superficial analysis, i.e. none, of what this really entailed back in 1975 when we had the vote. But, you know, 40-odd years on... You know, we really haven't got too much excuse, and the information is a lot more readily available. The reality is that the legislation in the EU comes from a multiple range of sources. Officially, it comes from the Council of Ministers. Down through, because even the commissioners, I mean, listen to what Tony Blair has to say about the role of the commissioner and the inability of the commissioner to be able to initiate the process of new legislation. Actually, where it originates from is the bureaucrats. The bureaucrats, the faceless people in Brussels and Strasbourg who create the legislation, their pet legislation, often on behalf of powerful lobbyists, and they know the channels by which to get the council of ministers to rubber stamp the approval process. How many pieces of legislation, EU legislation, have been initiated since... Britain was lured into the EU in 1975. Good guess. Keep going. Keep going. Yeah, 122,000 pieces of legislation. How many of those have been put on the British statute books since 1975? How many? 45, 45, no, 45 is closer. No, the, re the reality is that about 20,000 of the 122,000 pieces of legislation have got onto the statute books. Why? Because we haven't got enough civil servants to rubber stamp them. And that's the only reason they're not in the UK statute books, is because they're not rubber stamped. But ostensibly, because EU law effectively has supremacy over UK law, the fact that it hasn't been stamped into UK law yet is almost an irrelevance. And yet, we're not told this, are we, really? No? Why do you think the Parliament is empty for the entire week except for 12 noon on a Wednesday? And the only time people make the effort to go to Parliament is 12 noon on Wednesday because they know that on 12 noon on Wednesday, a significant chunk of the population, you know, a few percentage points, watch the media coverage of Prime Minister's questions. The zoo. For the rest of the week, you're lucky if there's half a dozen people actually in the chamber. It's a charade, a total charade for the masses, that's all, just to keep the masses thinking that there is some kind of democratic process in this country. Europe 
is an agenda. It's a long-standing agenda. It's an agenda that is now almost 100 years old, almost exactly 100 years old, because we can actually trace it back to the 1920s. And uh, this is the guy, and in fact, I think it was Max that mentioned uh, this guy in his presentation. This is uh, Count uh, Kudenhove Kalergi, who wrote a number of books um, in, the late, uh, in, in the immediate years post-First World War. He's an Austrian count. And I'll paraphrase, paraphrase. But the primary uh, template is a book called Pan Europa. And basically, his game plan was to destroy the homogeneity of Europe, to destroy the nation states of Europe. And what he said was that you should destroy the masses, the mass population, reduce their education to a minimal level, and create a mongoloid European state ruled by the traditional aristocracy and the spiritual elite. And I have quoted that last sentence. The traditional aristocracy and the spiritual elite. Who do you think he was referring to when he referred to the spiritual elite? The Zionists, ostensibly, at that time. The Zionists. That's who he was referring to. And, of course, the Zionist agenda had been established by you know, Theodore Herzl about uh, 30, 35 years uh, previously. Count Kudenhove Kalergi. So, yeah, this is a guy who writes a book. Yeah, it's just a book. You know, doesn't have any basis in um, current policy. Well, let me just introduce you to Peter Sullivan. Anybody come across this sociopath? He's an Irishman by accident of birth. I'm amazed that... Uh, wh where's our pyro pyromaniacs? <laughs> this is the guy... I mean, he's the, he was the youngest Attorney General of Ireland. That launched his political career. He then went on to become an EU commissioner. He chaired the GATT talks in the early 90s. He was the founding Director General of uh, um, the World Trade Council. And, and he was chairman of uh, BP, chairman of Goldman Sachs. He's still chairman of Goldman Sachs International. Um, yeah, he, he was on the board of Royal Bank of Scotland when it collapsed. Uh, I mean, th this guy, you know, the, the interconnectivity is, is just something else. But he is also responsible for advising member countries of the EU on immigration. And this is a quote from an interview that he gave to the BBC on June 21st, 2012. And he said that EU should do its best to undermine the homogeneity of its member states. Peter Sutherland told Piers, the future prosperity of many EU states depends on them becoming multicultural. He also suggests the, EU, uh, gov the UK government's immigration policy has no base in, basis in international law. Basically, open your doors, open your doors, and let them all in. Well, who was he speaking to at that point? the House of Lords. <laughs> said, we still nurse a sense of our homogeneity and difference from others. And that's precisely what the European Union, in my view, should be doing its best to undermine. He destroyed Ireland. This is the guy who wasn't physically present but he was behind the meeting that took place between Brian Cowan, Brian Lenihan, um, and the, uh, the Attorney General, the head of uh, AIB, the Bank of Ireland, in Sept on September 28th, I think it was, 2008, where he effectively instructed the Irish government to underwrite all the assets and liabilities of the Irish banks, effectively condemning the state to bankruptcy. That was his job. Yeah? And this is what he had to do. He had to destroy his own country to establish his loyalty. You see, it comes back to what I say. You know, these guys, they work on the basis that the more they do to further the agenda, then the higher up the pecking order they come back when they reincarnate in their perverse belief system. Let's get a bit closer to home, though. Peter Mandelson openly stating, immigrants 
we sent out search parties to get them to come and made it hard for Britons to get work. CEOs love this because it means that they can reduce their employee costs. You know, once upon a time, employee costs, particularly in the manufacturing business, would average about uh, 25 to 30 percent of uh, total revenue. So it was the biggest single outgoing for a manufacturing company. Automation, of course, has helped um, to reduce that. But so has availability of labor. Minimum wage and zero hours contract. Both are abominations. I saw a statistic just two days ago from the Institute of Directors that said that for every 100 immigrants that get work in this country, 25 UK nationals are put out of work. Now, this is not a one-dimensional issue by any stretch of the imagination. Don't get me wrong. I, we have created, we the collective we, have created a horrendous mess in the Middle East, an area that I love. I lived there for you know, four years in the early 90s, traveled extensively. You know, my territory was everything between Egypt in uh, the southwest and Iran in the northeast. Wonderful people, wonderful cultures. And we have allowed our governments to destroy these cultures. And they're not going to stop anytime soon. So we have a responsibility to the people that we're bombing out of their homes. But that doesn't mean to say that we should open the doors. There's other ways to deal with responsibility. And we've always had immigration. We've always had people from other countries coming into this country on a needs basis, you know, where there's been jobs or skills that we don't have in this country that we've needed to bring in from outside. Absolutely. That's part of, you know, transfer of knowledge, transfer of skills, and, you know, our own broader education. You know, when I went and lived in these countries, I took it as an opportunity to experience the culture. I didn't try and change the culture. Neither did I embed myself in it. I didn't actually wear the dish dash, you know, in the UAE. Didn't have one my colour. <laughs> but I didn't mean to say I had to embed myself in the culture, but, you know, the two could coexist. I had something that they wanted, and you know, in return, I got to live a pretty nice lifestyle out there. But then it was time for me to leave. I will also readily acknowledge there were things that you had to do this to, to live in the Middle East. You know, their, their policy of using uh, third country nationals for a lot of the construction work, you know, no health and safety practices. You see the Indians and the Pakistanis and the Filipinos climbing up to build these buildings in, on bamboo, uh, scaffolding in bare feet, no hard hats. And just as a contract had finished, and the, uh, the uh, prime contractor, the local partner, would be responsible for paying for all of the airfares to ship these people home. There'd be a her ter terrible, horrendous fire in the shanty towns where these people lived in the desert. It's not all pretty, for sure. You know, but at the end of the day, I was a guest. I was a guest in that country. And if I didn't like it, I could leave. Well, ultimately, I did. But... I'm not suggesting that you know, everything is wonderful, but does it give us the right to bomb these cultures into the Stone Age? I don't think so. This is a deliberate policy to destroy EU nation states, to destroy national homogeneity, to mongrelize Europe exactly as spelled out by Kalergi in 1920. In the EU, there is a Kudenhof Kalergi Award that is given to the politician that is deemed to have done the most to further this policy of undermining EU national homogeneity. You want to guess who have been a few of the winners of this? Who? Merkel, yes. Yes. Blair, yes. Peter Sutherland, twice. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't take a rocket scientist, does it? And did we see this on the front pages of the National Press? Tony Blair awarded Kudenhove Kalergi Award. No, of course not. Of course not. So we've got to find a balance. So what's going to happen on the 23rd? <laughs> well, you know, we're going to take time out of work. <laughs> Who, who's going to vote? Yeah, okay. I, I, listen, 
I actually believe it, my counsel on this is that we have to vote. Let's not make it easy for them. Right? If we don't participate in the process, then once again, we're just handing it to them on a plate. They don't care why we don't participate. They don't care why we don't vote as long as we don't. If everybody who didn't vote in the last two elections had voted for the same party, that party would now be in power. I, it's a party that doesn't exist, obviously. But that's the magnitude of the apathy in this country. Or the conscious decision. And I do understand some people's conscious decision not to vote. And I readily acknowledge that I'm open to be labelled a hypocrite because I'm not on an electoral register because I don't have a fixed address. But not, if you do, if you are on an electoral register, then vote. Don't make it easy for them. Let's make it more difficult for them to manipulate so that the manipulation becomes more obvious. And then more people will actually see what's occurring. So a lot of people believe that the manipulation is going to be to keep us in. And that may well be an outcome. I certainly you know, haven't read the definitive script on this. That may well be an outcome. And if that is the case, we have a big problem. We have a real problem. Because that will be the first time since 1975 that the British people will have effectively given the British government a mandate to basically say, you know, let's not pussyfoot around anymore. Let's go the whole hog. And that whole hog is going to be unfolded at a phenomenal rate of knots. But I'm not sure that that's going to happen. I don't think that's enough for these sociopaths who want the European superstate and want the destruction of the national homogen homogeneity of the uh, European countries. So I will not be at all surprised if the ballot is either let go as it think, uh, we think it might unfold, i.e. that the vote is to come out, or that it is manipulated to bring us out. So what will be the purpose of that? Because people go, yes, we need to come out. Okay. Problem there is that then this government will no longer be constrained by any of that sugar coating that's in the EU legislation that we are using today. And I suspect that the opportunity through things like the Extremism Act, it's a bill now, but it will be an act, will be used to wipe out, shut down, incarcerate any dissent in this country. If we come out after the June ballot, there is a very good possibility that this country will be deliberately destroyed. The purpose being to create a situation where in, let's say, seven to ten years, the population of this country are gagging to get back in. And at that point, it'll be a case of, okay, well, you can come back in, but this time it will be on our terms. You will subjugate the nation state in totality. Apart from the city of London, of course. Now, they, of course, will be relying at that point on a continued non-participation. So if that is the prognosis, there will be a massive responsibility on the people of this country to take their country back. And that I'm not this is not a far right take the country back. This is bring sanity to the country, sanity to an economic policy, sanity to a financial strategy, effectively do an Iceland. I mean, how sad is that? You know, we, we've got a country, that 300,000 people, and basically, you know, that's, that's the country that's really the model. It, it's set up the model financial system outside, or slowly being clawed back already, but it's outside of the global central banking system. So once we're out, yeah, we've got a hell of a lot of work to do. Hell of a lot of work. Because if we just do sit back and go, well, thank God we're out. <laughs> Believe you me, it's not going to be pretty. Does this sound plausible? So, again, it comes down to sowing the seeds. 
Yes, we do have to come out. In my opinion, we do have to come out. Because if we don't come out, then we, you know, we have gifted. We've been lured by the sugar coating, and then we'll effectively end up in the same situation as uh, Greece and Ireland and Spain and Portugal. And if we think we've got austerity in this country right now, we ain't seen nothing yet. We ain't seen nothing yet. Now, just, I just want to uh, throw in something on the immigration debate. Because let me just ask you a question. How many people here were, if it, create a hypothetical country? Let's just, well, yeah, hypothetical country. Let's say that country had an economy where a bus driver, a bus driver could earn something in the region of about £3,000 a week. Who'd be up for that? Yeah, who would consider emigrating or even just going abroad for a couple of years on their own, leave the family at home because they could earn 3,000 plus a week as a bus driver? Yeah? Okay, 12,000 pounds a month, 144,000 pounds a year. That's about six and a half, seven times the average national wage in this country, which is about 22,500 pounds, allegedly. Well, but that's why we have a massive immigration issue. Because for people who live in a lot of developing nations, African nations, Middle Eastern nations, to come here and get a job as, say, a bus driver, they're earning the equivalent of six and seven times what they can earn in their own country. So, of course, they're going to make an effort to come here. Who can blame them for that? You know? Of course. So... I don't hold anything against those individuals for wanting to better the lives of themselves and their families because we would do the same if we had the same opportunity in this fictional country. So, of course, they're going to come here. And if we open the borders completely, then I can assure you that, you know, we've got a situation at the moment where more people are earning minimum wage or are on zero-hours contracts than ever since records began. But if, if we go into the EU on a fully-fledged basis, it's going to grow exponentially. And what you're going to have is a massive distortion in the earnings. So you're going to have your CEOs and the officers of companies who are going to probably double, treble what they're already earning because the profitability of the company will go exponential because they're able to reduce all their employee costs and associated costs with that. So how are you going to vote? <laughs> Do vote, though. Don't tell me how you... Do vote. If you have the opportunity to vote, please do vote. The Kalergi plan. And, of course, you know, we have all of the manipulation. And notice the colours here. Notice the colours. You know, the red, white, and blue. I mean, obviously, this was classic PR. It is a tragedy. There's no question. It's a tragedy. It's a tragedy of our creation but it's being used to undermine everything about our lives. You know, this is a game of global monopoly, and I've uh, you know, showed these pics on many presentations. This, of course, is from Brick Lane in uh, 2012, a wonderful piece of uh, street art. You know, the global banksters playing their game monopoly on the backs of humanity. You know, meanwhile, they create this massive public debt. To whom? To whom? The banksters. The banksters, yeah. It's fake debt. And, you know, here it is. Spell out for us, isn't it? You've all seen this by now, haven't you? You know, this was the artwork that was used in France, in the Netherlands, and in Ireland, on the bus shelters, on the posters, on the street, to promote membership of the EU. Yet, on careful examination... On careful examination, what do we see? You know, here's the inner sanctum, the Tower of Babel. Yeah, mirroring, of course, Strasbourg. Yeah. Here we have the sociopaths, those who have prostituted themselves, those who in return for the trinkets, in return for the titles, in return for the lifestyle, will do whatever it is that they're asked to do. Would they sell their mother? Would they kill their youngest child? 
Oh, maybe they have. You know, Gordon Brown, David Cameron. <sighs> Looking longingly across, longingly across. What have we got to do to get in the inner sanctum? They'll never get in there. They'll never get in there. It doesn't matter what they do. They will never get in there. You know, the only, there's no word in the English language, well, no polite word, to describe these guys. But, the, you know, the German, the National Socialists had the term capo, Kampolizei. You know, in the um, ghettos, they appointed senior members of the community to administer the ghetto, to um, be responsible for the allocation of housing, for food, and, of course, for providing the lists for transshipment to the work camps and whatever else. And yet, when the ghetto was emptied, where did they go? Yeah, they were on the last truck out. They were on the last truck out. They went the same way, because those in the inner sanctum treat these people, I believe, with even more contempt than the masses. But here we have the masses depicted. And you can see how they're depicted, yeah? The blockheads, they're all depicted as blockheads, except one, the baby. The baby, the, only, the baby here is the only one with any kind of normal features. The blockheads telling us what they're doing. You know, the, their goal is to make sure that by the time any human entering this physical realm, by the time they get to young adulthood, they're a blockhead. You know, they are literally a slave to the system, cannon or factory fodder. It's all out there. Spelt out. Now, I, for one, am certainly not proud of the legacy that uh, we are leaving for future generations. You know, I mean, it, it is an absurdity. You know, the corporatocracy. And it's spelt out for us. Many people have tried to spell it out. You know, the establishment is walking us in to the barcode in every way, shape, or form. And as has been discussed through the weekend, you know, they're literally trying to completely shut down any understanding or access to the right brain. I mean, Holly touched it. Holly referenced Tony Wright. Amazing guy. In fact, I have to have Tony Wright to speak at a future AV event. And if you haven't read Tony Wright's book, Left in the Dark, you absol I absolutely recommend this book. You know? um, <clears throat> Left in the Dark. And what Tony is really working on is his research into the efforts made by the establishment to completely lock us in to the left hemisphere of our brain and shut down the right hemisphere. The left hemisphere, of course, is that transmitter-receiver that is very limited in its frequency bandwidth and locks us into this three-dimensional charade and completely shuts down our capacity to connect with everything on the wider scale. And once we are able to cross the corpus callosum, and the more time we're able to spend in the right side of the brain, the more of a problem we are to the establishment. So we have it all to play for. We really do, not for ourselves, but for future generations. You know, and at the same time, you know, I do relate to what Zen said last night. You know, in the scheme of things, it doesn't matter. It will be what it will be. But does that mean to say that we just sit back and... Because if we don't get it right this time, if we don't sort it out this time, guess what? You're coming back. And you want to do this again? <laughs> so let's make the effort you know, and really try to bring about the changes that we all know we need to see, but without the existential attachment. Because the moment that you do have that existential attachment, then you're limiting the potential outcome. You know, there's a wonderful... A uh, quote from David Monk in my documentary, Voices from the Gas Fields. If at this point in time you can stand in front of a, a, a drill rig and stop it from getting on, the easiest drill rig to stop is the first one. <laughs> the hardest one will be the 10,000th. It'll be more than that, though, in the UK, because you're doing shale over there predominantly. Shale needs a lot of wells, leads a lot of destruction, poisons a lot of water. If this gets the tiniest foothold, you know, you're done. So it's now or it's never. Don't think that you've got that long because it's now or never.
So you either, you do it now, you stand up now, and you find something within yourself that you didn't think was there. You know, that's the important thing. You will be confronted by police. They wear their Kevlar suits, and, and, and it's a big intimidation thing. And you've got nobody in front of you. Keep walking. You're delaying this lady. Keep going. Not Don't push back me. on her. Keep moving. Not now. Me. If you've got to keep going. You're not going to keep moving. Keep walking. It's up to the people of the UK to get their cameras in the face of the Kevlar security, the Kevlar police who are paid by the corporations. And we have to say, no, that's all it is. But it's more than just saying no at a meeting. It's intent, it's the intent of no, it's the knowing that you mean no. That's when you will be unbelievably powerful. You, you come out in numbers, if they see your grandmother and the mother and, the, and the, the child come out and say, we are not going to accept this, then they are finished. But that's what it takes. Don't sit back and think that anybody's looking out for you, it's you. Where he makes the observation, you know, he says, you come out in numbers. If they see your grandmother and the mother and the child come out and say, we're not going to accept this, then they are finished. But that's what it takes. Don't sit back and think that anybody else is looking out for you. It's you. It's every one of us. And if we don't put in the effort, then we are, directly or indirectly, however you want to perceive it, making a contribution to the sociopathic global corporatist agenda of total global dominion and subjugation of humanity until such time as they're able to go through the process of transhumanism and create the droids that they need to support their system and the rest can just disappear. You know, Marcus Aurelius, a warrior, spirit, uh, um, and a philosopher of the uh, second century AD, he said, what we do in life ripples through eternity. So don't think for one moment that any action that we take is not relevant or not important. It doesn't matter how much or how little you do. Yeah, we've all got other lives that we have to take care of. We've got family responsibilities. And of course, they have to take priority. But we can all find an extra bit of time. And it doesn't matter what you choose to get involved in, because there's so many issues and none of us can get involved in everything, God forbid. So it doesn't matter what you pick up on, you know, whether it's the geoengineering, whether it's the GM foods, whether it's the unconventional gas agenda, you know, whether it's the fluoride in the water, whether it's the financial system, you know, whether it's the getting involved in the politics. I mean, go and, you know, for some people, get in there, get in among, go join your local Conservative or Labour Party, infiltrate them as they try to infiltrate us. You know, there are no rules in this game except be true to your own humanity. And you know, somebody, I think it was a golfer, who said, you know, it's, it's really interesting. He said, you know, the more I practice, the better I seem to get. <laughs> and it's the same with everything, the more you practice. If you find out that something's working, then, you know, you don't necessarily need to go and uh, shout it from the rooftops, perhaps. But if you know it works, and you know that you can use that in some way, then use it. We have access to a phenomenal range of tools. We have access to a phenomenal range of creativity. The away team don't. They are actually very limited in what they can do by their own rules, by their own procedures, by their own statutes. There's way more of us than there is of them. And I know, I absolutely know, that we will come through. It's not going to be easy by any stretch of the imagination. If it was easy, then you know, we wouldn't be here. It's a learning as well. Let's maximize this learning opportunity because I have no idea where we take that learning, but I know we take it somewhere. And that learning is going to be extremely crucial to us and to future generations. So thank you very much for participating in AB7. <laughs>